Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are looking back at the peace movement against the war on Iraq, or that phase of it that began 20 years ago. Our guest, David Courtright, is Professor Emeritus and Special Advisor for Policy Studies at the Keough School of Global Affairs and Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. He was an organizer for peace as an active duty soldier during the Vietnam War, executive director of SANE, the Committee for a SANE Nuclear Policy, 1977 to 1988, co-founder and board member of Win Without War, and author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of 22 books, including a terrific new book called A Peaceful Superpower, Lessons from the World's Largest Anti-War Movement. Uh, David Courtright, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Good to be with you. Uh, great to have you on. So uh, what uh, what do you think people have forgotten or weren't born for that they, that they should in particular remember or learn about this period? Yeah, like the whole Iraq war seems to be mostly forgotten. We're coming up on the 20 year mark since the invasion. Hopefully it'll come back into consciousness. Uh, but this was hugely controversial, controversial at the time. You had a, a worldwide movement, really the largest in history, uh, of opposition to the war in many, many countries. And, and on that particular date of February 1502, you had demonstrations across the globe, 600 cities or more, at least 10 to 15 million people, or maybe more, it's uncountable really, of people protesting against the war. Uh, public opinion in countries everywhere was 70, 80% opposed to the invasion. And you had really significant countries that traditionally have joined the U.S. in our military misadventures, uh, like Canada, uh, like Turkey, uh, Germany, uh, saying no and refusing to send any troops and actively campaigning against the war. And here in the U.S., uh, very substantial demonstrations and protests. Uh, the big ones were in New York in February and also in San Francisco. But there were countless local protests going on, vigils, uh, of all sorts of events right up to the eve of the invasion. People saying no, that this war uh, was folly, that it would kill hundreds of thousands of innocent people. Uh, and as one of the core messages said, and you uh, identified this in a recent mailing that you sent out, uh, that this war was likely to increase the terrorism threat that we were supposedly fighting against. And there's a famous uh, newspaper ad that Fenton Communications created where it has a image of Osama bin Laden in an Uncle Sam outfit saying, go ahead and attack, kind of make my day. It'll drive more recruits to my terrorist organizations. And of course, that unfortunately is exactly what happened. And there's still, of course, instability across that region. The people of Iraq are still suffering from violence and oppression. ISIS emerged from all of that chaos. It's still a problem. So created a, a hornet's nest and a a process of instability and violence and suffering that is continuing to this day. And there's been no accountability at all. Uh, you know, people say about, you know, war crimes tribunals for Putin and the Russians nowadays. Well, there have been no tribunals or any kinds of accountability for uh, Bush and Blair and Dick Cheney and Condoleezza Rice and others who were the principal war makers in those days. Uh, so it's important to remember this movement we were right in speaking out against the war. Uh, we had some impacts. Uh, we certainly internationally were uh, prevented Bush from getting endorsement from the UN Security Council. He was not really able to internationalize the war. Uh, he created the so-called coalition of the willing, but it was a, a threadbare arrangement when you look at it and very little actual military involvement from other countries. And one of the telling and grim statistics for us as Americans uh, is that 93% of the casualties at that war were American troops. Uh, there was no real help from other countries. We fought this war on our own. And it was essentially a strategic defeat. Can, can I stop you right there, David? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm pretty certain over 95% of the casualties were Iraqis. Well, yes, of course. Yeah. If you think about, you know, I'm thinking about the of the combat uh, casualties in the war itself. But yes, 
Uh, yeah, there, there, we don't think about the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis who died. There were a number of scientific studies on this, and I, I went down the rabbit hole of studying all of those some couple of years ago, and, and John Tierman uh, recently passed away, but he did a book on, on, on this and on the casualties of other wars that the United States has fought. But in Iraq, easily half a million people died. And that's in a very rigorous, uh, cautious scientific studies. Uh, probably if you put together the, all of the casualties of the war, including from the ISIS conflict, they're getting up near a million. And then we forget about the sanctions that were imposed during the 1990s that caused a severe humanitarian crisis in Iraq and led to hundreds of thousands of preventable deaths during that era. So, you know, certainly more than a million people died as a result of our policies, a million Iraqis. Yeah, and, and a lot of people would draw the lesson, have drawn the lesson and been encouraged to draw the lesson from what you've just said, uh, that uh, peace movements are a failure, that you can have the biggest marches and demonstrations and demonstrations are proven useless and you can have majority opinion and governments don't care. And it was a complete failure. Um, but there is actually, it, it's not completely false, but there is some partial successes, right? I mean, there was something of a, of a movement built that went on and did other things. There was something of an Iraq syndrome, didn't last as long as the Vietnam syndrome, right? Not, the failure was not complete, right? Oh, exactly. And I always say that peace movements always have impacts. We may not achieve our primary goals, but we affect how the political decision makers respond and what they do. Uh, there's a phrase I quote in the book from the great writer, Rebecca Solnit, when she said, it's always too early to calculate effect. Uh, and as you point out, uh, we didn't stop the invasion, but uh, about 10 years later, when the US and the UK were getting ready to send troops into Syria, uh, there was an overwhelming sense that, no, we've been down this mistake before, uh, down this mistaken path before. And in the UK parliament, especially some of the leading members of parliament said that the shadow of the Iraq war loomed over that debate. And the same was true in the US Congress. Uh, the House of Representatives, they never did have a vote, but uh, the opposition was mounting rapidly in Congress. There were demonstrators outside, uh, and Obama and the White House saw that uh, this was an unpopular war. You're right, it's, it's uh, uh, Iraq-Vietnam syndrome. Tom Hayden wrote about it, and he said, well, we had the Vietnam syndrome back in the day, and then Bush the first tried to beat the Vietnam syndrome, as he said, with the first Gulf War. Uh, but now, we saw that the second Gulf War by Bush Jr. was a disaster and hugely unpopular, and it created its own syndrome. Yeah. And uh, I hope we're still living with some of that. Maybe that was some of the impetus where you saw the idea of end endless wars suddenly out there in all the political campaigns. Even Trump suggested that he was behind that position. Uh, and I keep reminding people that slogan, end endless wars, began as a move on bumper sticker back in 02. <laughs> then it became something that was part of the political discourse. So um, yeah, all right, these movements have effects. And, and if you look at uh, some of the other countries, as I say, uh, in Germany and, and Canada and others, uh, these movements were sufficiently strong that they prevented governments that might otherwise be inclined to support the US from going along. Yeah. We're speaking with David Courtright about the book, A Peaceful Superpower, Lessons from the World's Largest Anti-War Movement. And one reason to, to read it is to remember some of the great slogans and messaging and, and graphics and advertisements. Uh, David, how much do you think the the forgetting and the wearing away of the of what, of what we go along with calling a disease, the, the Iraq syndrome, has to do with the lack of follow through with the looking forward, as President Obama put it, uh, sort of turning war and murder and torture and spying and imprisonment into policy choices rather than questions of of law. Yeah. And it's and that's all tied to the effort by the decision makers to escape responsibility. They don't want to probably remember the horrendous mistakes that they made and the costs of those mistakes. Uh, and it's abetted by our, our political culture and the media. 
I mean, we have to think about the appalling, astonishing gullibility of the U.S. media in falling for all of these deceptions that the Bush administration was putting out about WMDs and all of that. Uh, and then the lack of accountability when the war obviously was going disastrously. Uh, you had senior officials in the U.S. military admitting that it was a mistake. And Dan Bolger, a general, wrote a book called Why We Lost and you know other uh, studies. You, you never had that, uh, certainly by the political decision-making class, but in the media either. I mean, it's they've gone forward unblushed and, and they continue with some of the same mistaken policies today. They accept the Pentagon's uh, system of controlling reporters who try to uh, do a job of being journalists about our military policies. Uh, so, and, and all of us, I mean, I think, yes, in the peace movement, uh, we should have provided more sustained uh, resistance and opposition. Uh, we did kind of rouse ourselves again when the Syria intervention loomed on the horizon. Uh, but uh, all of us need to recognize that we're in this state uh, policies of the U.S. that are based on war making and it keeps rearing its head from time to time. And uh, so and the system of militarism is a profound uh, disease, if you will, at the heart of the American political system. Uh, yeah. I was speaking to uh, a group of students and faculty about this the other day and in, re in relation to the book, and I mentioned this idea of a national security state that exists in the US. And uh, I saw a lot of puzzled looks, so I had to come back and kind of explain how the US political system and structure is established, at least since the Cold War, if not before, uh, where the military and the military industries and their minions within Congress and in the media uh, dominate the discourse and drive us towards these war policies. No question. And that is the disease, not not resistance. <laughs> <to it. laughs> yes. um, but yeah. it seems like one of the things that that the peace movement did right, at least for a brief period of time, was to be willing to form uncomfortably large coalitions uh, mm -hmm. to find it more important to oppose massive mass murder uh, than to avoid uh, being in a coalition with some group that had other agendas. They weren't part of the, the rally or the event, but had other agendas that, that one disagreed with. That seems to have flipped. Uh, it seems for many people now it's more important to denounce and cancel someone uh, than to form a larger coalition around an, a, a particular agenda that people agree on. Um, do you yeah. agree? Absolutely, a really critical point. I remember during the Vietnam War, as you mentioned in the intro, I was a soldier in the army opposed to the war and I was based out in Texas. And, uh, and we were doing demonstrations and organizing against the war there at Fort Bliss in, in Western Texas. And, uh, and we'd see the anti-war coalitions in Washington feuding among themselves and arguing. And, and I remember we wrote this, seems like a forlorn gesture at the time, but we wrote a letter to the big coalitions. This is probably around 1970 or so, just saying, uh, please, you know, we're out here in the base. You know, some of us are being sent to Vietnam. We're fighting for our lives. Uh, can't you get organized and do a more effective job of, of working together? Uh, during the Iraq war, we also had different coalitions. There was ANSWER, uh, which started first, uh, and then the uh, United, for Peace and Just, uh, yeah, United for Peace and Justice, UFPJ, and then Win Without War. Um, but I think the coalitions were able to work together better than they had during the Vietnam days. So ANSWER was very much a street protest. Uh, UFPJ also very much uh, mobilizing at the grassroots level for uh, citizen action. Win Without War was trying to engage more with media communications and try to interact with the political uh, leaders in Congress who might be willing to oppose the war. Um, but, you know, there were different functions and we could work together reasonably well. And it's, it's necessary in building peace movements, and I think really all movements, that while we have our demands and the, it's important to have a clear in, uh, analysis of what are the necessary goal, uh, policies to change the direction, uh, we need to be able to work with others who disagree with us on some of our points and find the commonality where we can work together. And the, the Iraq war was relatively easy in that regard. It was so outrageous, so obviously unnecessary. And uh, again, the imperative to save lives uh, that we knew this would lead to 
many thousands of deaths of Iraqi people and innocent civilians. Uh, and we were determined to try to stop that loss of life. So um, yeah, being able to agree and disagree at the same time is a challenge for uh, peace movements. Yes, uh, for everyone. So often we're focused on the purity of our ideals, you know, and, and that's all correct and important, but uh, we also need to work together and share a broader agenda. We, we also need to discuss the things we disagree with and figure out who's right and who's wrong and learn from each other uh, or teach each other uh, without emotions entering into it. Yeah. Um, and exactly. so so here's a question I think we may disagree with, and it may be because I'm wrong. Uh, the, the, the book Party in the Streets seemed to suggest that we got this big peace movement because people identify principally with one of the two big political parties, and one of them seemed sort of okay with peace for a little while, uh, and then it didn't. And we really saw the funding and the energy draw dry up in around 2007 and everything go into electing Democrats and electing a Democratic president because we'd already elected Democrats to a majority in both houses of Congress to end the war and got a bigger war out of it. Uh, and that seems to me to be to have been a problem. I, we, when, when and why do you think the peace movement shrank? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, this is a, a really important point. Uh, and I have a whole chapter in the book, uh, Protest and Politics, uh, and this interaction between uh, action in the streets and lobbying and electoral work in the suites, uh, inside, outside, outside politics, are a big deal in all the academic studies. And they're a real challenge for us in practice in, in movements. Uh, you know, I, I agree that the, the movement as it started was overwhelmingly in the streets and it had to be. Uh, the Congress had a chance to vote on the war and unfortunately I voted in favor of it in October of 02. Uh, in fact, thankfully now 20 years later, <laughs> Congress is finally revoking that <laughs> authorization to use force from that, from that period. But uh, so we were, in the streets protesting, and, and that continued even after the war, although the protests became smaller. Uh, but there were some in the movement, and there always are, who wanted to also engage in electoral activities. Uh, and in 04, there were a few options. You know, the uh, Howard Dean campaign initially appeared like it might be a vehicle for anti-war sentiment, but uh, he didn't go anywhere and his position was very weak. And then John Kerry uh, was actually indistinguishable in his position from Bush's. Uh, but, uh, and there wasn't much electoral activity really until later, 05 and 06, partly because the war was going so badly. It was uh, eroding uh, support for Republicans in the polls. And you saw this remarkable shift in the 06 elections, as you mentioned, where the Democrats won control of the Congress, principally on the Iraq issue. And many activists in local campaigns uh, mobilized four candidates, you know, in Connecticut and, uh, and many other states, uh, you saw a big mobilization by activists to get behind candidates who were pledged to oppose the war. Uh, and in 07, in 06 and 07, there was an effort to uh, develop legislation for the withdrawal of troops. So this whole issue of a timetable for withdrawal became a big part of the a political debate in Washington, and that was driven by the anti, well, less supportive of the war <laughs> politicians in the Democratic Party and by activists. But it's true that the, the Democrats, even though they won the House and Senate in 06 because of the Iraq issue, when they first came into office in 07, they put out their political program and Iraq wasn't even on it. And I remember there was a fury of action and group like, groups like Code Pink demonstrated out of outside of Nancy Pelosi's house, and Tom Hayden and others uh, had these meetings with uh, Harry Reid and other leaders in the Senate to push the politicians to say, you know, you got elected on this issue, you have to deliver, you have to urge a timetable for withdrawal of troops. Uh, not only did they not act, uh, Rahm Emanuel openly told the Washington Post, we're going to keep the war going so we can have a campaign against it again in two years. Yeah. And we had MoveOn.org doing all of its anti-war rallies only in Republican 
Congress members' districts. Uh, you had uh, Eli Pariser, uh, you know, falsely pretending that Move On members had voted for uh, a proposal to keep the war going. Uh, this sort of cynicism turns people off yeah. to political parties, uh, and I think the peace movement pushed uh, someone in office, George W. Bush, to sign an agreement to get the troops out of Iraq. And the peace movement should get credit for that, even though it didn't have anything to do with an election. And when the next guy got in office, President Obama, he only withdrew those troops when he had to because of that agreement that Bush had signed. And yet we want to pat ourselves on the back and say that electing him was what did it. I This is where I stray from the, this idea on the uh, exactly how important elections are supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, those are all good points. Uh, when you're engaged in the political process as a pr protester, as a social movement, uh, it's an ambiguous, frustrating, and often unrewarding uh, process uh, because you're pushing politicians who are inherently part of the political system to do things that are against <laughs> the grain. Um, I think you're right about the decision by Bush to sign that status of forces agreement with the Iraqi government in uh, October of 08, I believe it was. Uh, and and we, as, as the movement and the few Democrats who were really with us, like uh, uh, Barbara Green and others, did push the uh, timetable for withdrawal issue and made it a majority issue. It did pass uh, in Congress uh, two or three times in 07, although Bush uh, vetoed it. Um, and then he went ahead with this crazy uh, surge policy, as you say, expanded the war actually. Um, but that was uh, a process, and I, you know, if I were adding a chapter to it now, I might like to probe that more deeply. You know, where did that idea come from? Uh, certainly, it wasn't what Bush and the military establishment were favoring. Uh, it is interesting that the Iraqis certainly were favoring that and were demanding that the U.S. withdraw its troops. Uh, there was a parliamentary system set up in Iraq, uh, and certainly the Iraqi people wanted the American troops out. So that was also part of the initiative. But I think you're right that uh, we need to think about our efforts in that regard uh, as having put that idea in the air and made it a, a viable proposition that Bush reluctantly ended up agreeing to. Uh, and then Obama, as you say, he campaigned on a commitment to end the war. That's what distinguished him from Hillary Clinton in the earlier primaries. And he also relied on the organizational capacity of the movement and move on and other groups, civil rights groups and others. Uh, and uh, that's what propelled him into office. Uh, so we deserve some credit for that. But I think, I, I think most of us had our eyes open. We knew that Obama was not a peace candidate. He even said back in 02, when he made his first public statement against the war when he was a state senator in, in Illinois. And he said, I'm, I'm not opposed to all wars, I'm opposed to dumb wars. Uh, well, yeah, Iraq was a dumb war, but so are almost all of them. So, um, and he you know, expanded the drone wars and counterinsurgency wars, uh, the disastrous policy of overthrowing the government of Libya and on and on, many disasters in uh, Obama's foreign policy. Including, by the way, you know, on the China policy, where we're now in this insane idea that we're going to be confronting China militarily, it was Obama who first started this so-called, you know, uh, tilt towards Asia, and uh, which meant a tilt to confront China back in 2011. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, I want to. I, I want to restore one minor point to our sure. and that because I uh, maybe this is where some of my cynicism about elections comes from, but I worked for a campaign for a guy named Dennis Kucinich, who actually wanted peace in 04 and believed that Howard Dean was being put forward by the media as a peace candidate precisely because he wasn't, and that when they were done with him, they would toss him out uh, with the trash, which which they did in a matter of hours, quite impressively, uh, when he happened to scream. Uh, and so, and, and of course, Howard Dean has been a voice for war ever since, and Kucinich continues to be a voice for peace to this day. So I, I think, I, I think, 
I think your book, uh, David, does a tremendous job of, of stressing how important the media is, how important communications are. And I think they've worsened. I think the media has gotten worse from, from 20 years ago to today. And we're up against a bigger hurdle in trying to communicate uh, voices for peace. Do you, mm-hmm. do you agree? No, I, I agree. I don't know if it's gotten worse. It may have, but it's just as bad, certainly. And, you know, they're swallowing whole cloth now, these ideas about China and threats and, uh, and whipping up uh, more military and escalation uh, uh, in Russia and Ukraine. So uh, I think we have our social media tools now, and we have learned to use them. Uh, and we need to rely more and more on our own media. I mean, I think, thank you for your radio program and, and your work. Uh, and these kinds of outlets are critically important. And movements have always been that way. Uh, often in the old days, the first thing a movement would do is create a newspaper. And nowadays we have a website and then we have our uh, uh, online social media programs. So uh, yeah, we need to fight back against the media and the distortions that are still uh, and probably even greater now in terms of the threat they pose to us. We, If we had the ability, we have just a couple of minutes left. If we had the ability to so communicate we would be wise, I think, as suggested in your book, to get going earlier, uh, earlier on Iraq, but also what if we had opposed the buildup of hostilities in Eastern Europe and Ukraine before it got to the worst point? What if we opposed war with China over Taiwan now, not once the bombs are falling? Isn't this a lesson to be learned? Absolutely. We should be building a massive movement against war in China now. Uh, with Russia, yes. I mean, I was a, an opponent of the expansion of NATO in the early 90s when it started and tried to do some things then, spoke out against it. But really, we didn't organize against it as we should have. And we could have with our European friends. Uh, and uh, so start early <laughs> and go big early. And uh, we still have a, a need to see the opportunity to fight against any idea of a war or military confrontation with China. We need to cooperate with China. We don't agree with their communist system, but uh, to d- solve the problems of the world, especially climate change, we have to cooperate with China. Yeah, one of the biggest reasons to oppose war, I think, is the Absolutely. impediment it is to cooperation. It's, mm-hmm. yeah. we've, we've been speaking with David Courtright. Uh, David Courtright is Professor Emeritus and Special Advisor for Policy Studies at the Keough School of Global Affairs and Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. And the book, which I highly recommend, is A Peaceful Superpower, Lessons from the World's Largest Anti-War Movement. David Courtright, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Best wishes. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.